welcome back to another episode of the Higher Level Podcast. Um, so tonight we're joined back in the couch by head coach James Dillon. Um, it's good to see you back in the couch, James. Obviously you couldn't make the, the last episode because you had a... Family tra- commitments. Family commitments and obviously we've got Justin on as well. You're just off the back of a fight you were down at the MK, MTK Liverpool show. You were fighting on that show. So how was the, before we actually get to the fight, how was the show itself? What was the, the show set up like and did you enjoy fighting on the show? Aye, the venue, the venue is cool. I've been in the venue before, uh, in the Olympia and Liverpool, it's a class venue, but it's probably it's the best I've seen it set up in that. Like, mm. they've they obviously spent a lot of money, you know, and obviously all they're set up in that, and the cage was, the cage was minty, it was, bright, it was massive, it was nice and big, the canvas was nice. It was, it was a cool set up, the show was set up really well. Even though they announced I was for Doncaster, <laughs> said I was in a, said they played the rang walkout, walkout music, but you kind of get everything right, I suppose. So, so what, what was your walkout me- music meant to be, and what did it end up being? Post it was meant to be a post Malone song. Right. Uh, wow, but they ended up I can't remember what they played. The boy was standing looking at me, saying, Are "You sure this isn't your song?" And I says, "Mate, I know what my walkout song is. <laughs> They're telling you to go." I was just like, "Oh." Fuck, actually, let's just go. <laughs> then I've went out and then they've been announcing us, uh, me and Leo in the cage, and they've said my name for a start. They've spelled it wrong for the full build up to this fight as well, right. which is common. And then the terms of and said Justin Flanagan representing higher level martial arts from Doncaster, England. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't sound like I'm from Doncaster, then I think. No, no, you definitely don't sound like you're from Doncaster. Maybe because we're pals with Danny Mitchell and that, maybe that's, maybe that's what it was for. So is that, is that, was it off-putting in that, getting into the cage, was it just... Uh, no, I don't care, bit... I just started laughing, like, I was like, probably if you see it back in the video whenever it goes up. Mm-hmm. Uh, that when they actually announce it, I, I just turned and start laughing. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was quite funny, but it's just like, it's why the things was, you don't care about anything like that, it's just... The bright, it's all bright lights and it's cool to get used to like a big stage like that and it's just it's cool to just to see be there and be involved in it and get involved in it, it brings it pr- brought the best out in me and best out in my performance I enjoyed right. being on that stage and I feel I performed I performed well I performed the best I have yet mm-hmm. so I enjoyed that I probably enjoyed the experience on the show well, oh. obviously the fight itself looking back on it now in terms of performance and then ultimately the decision what were your thoughts well, I, I, I knew I performed well. I felt I felt great and I felt comfortable. Uh, I didn't feel under pressure. I didn't feel I didn't feel like I was getting landed on a lot. I felt like I was landing cleaner shots. I probably could have maybe stepped up and threw some more, but I felt mm-hmm. really comfortable in the fact that I didn't. I thought I was. I thought I lost the first because he got because of that takedown at the end of the first. I, I really want to watch it back again. I've not seen Aye. it back yet, so, but I know for a fact I maybe gave him the first because of the takedown, but he never done nothing off the takedown. Like, mm-hmm. At the end of the round, the first start of the round, they took me doing a bounce back to my feet. Right. And, and then, in the fact, that I lied, the takedown, it was at the end of the second round, but he never done, I never advanced off it. And then, but I felt, I felt, I gave him the first round and then I felt I won the second round with cleaner striking. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't I stuffed or oh, I've retaked any apart from but one right at the very end. I can't remember if how we got it, but I can remember being on my back for the last ten seconds, but we knew under no pressure. I had a guillotine, but I knew it wasn't tight mm-hmm. because he has a, a, a tripod in the mat, so I knew I was I wasn't gonna get the choke. And then I can remember releasing the guillotine and tried to switch to a triangle just as the bell went. So he never tried to advance position or he never advanced I never put me under any pressure at the end of that round so I felt I had done enough to win, win the second and I felt like I, I won the third but obviously it must have looked a lot closer than, than what I thought so I'd like to see it back there's a lot obviously there's a lot of shouts for both sides supposedly judging by everything that's going on social media the past mm. couple of years <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed it I enjoyed right. the fight Liam's a, a great talent and I see he's got he's going to the world in November. He says so. All the best to him. He's he's got a good gym. He's got good coaches, and he's he's only a kid. As he I'll keep saying, I'll keep reminding me. Oh no, he got beat off a kid. Oh, yeah. brilliant. He's not just any kid though. He's a super Aye. talented kid. who trains full time. There's not a lot of kids at eighteen year old who train full time. So mm-hmm. he should he should be good, and Aye. he is. So all the best to him in his career. He's he's got a big future ahead of him. He's and he's just this is he's not a right guy as well. He's not a bad kid. Aye. So. Is it, is it one of the ones then looking back on it you're just 
you have had a good experience. Obviously, the results one thing, but the exp- overall experience itself, it's, it's been good for you. Aye, at the end of the day, it's an amateur fight. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, it comes to back to the same, like, records are for DJs, aren't they? Aye. Like, the best in the world, like, it's no boxing. It's no, it's mm. no, it's no, it's not going to be another Floyd Mayweather 54 no or 55 no or whatever he is now, because it's, it's different. Our game's different. Mm-hmm. Like, everybody at the top of the sport's been beat, apart from Khabib. <laughs> Aye. But, like, there will be one day and there will be somebody who can who has got the who has got the blueprint to beat him. There's, there'll be somebody out there who can do it. They've just they've not found them yet. That's it. And for you, James, as well, in terms of the actual show set up, what, what what were your impressions of the show and how the guys were running it and how it set up? Um, as a whole, it was excellent. The venue's good. The, the guys running it, Chris Zorbro and stuff, has got a ton of experience with that venue. He used to run. Cage Gladiators and OMAC and stuff out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked, <coughs> it ran a lot like ACB where it started and then there was no, it just went it. So that, mm-hmm. there, there, was, there wasn't like massive production values with it, but it, it just went like a machine gun, which that suits the fighters better. It was just one fight after the next, after the next. I thought the, I think they'd been hit with some pullets and stuff. So some of the standard, the, some of the guys on it weren't the best. I think some guys in late notice and stuff, which is it's part of the game, I guess. But, it was decent. Um, they're coming to Glasgow next year as well, apparently. They might be coming to Glasgow in the summer of next year. So I spoke to them about it when I was down there. I think I'm going to maybe get involved with, with that in some degree. I don't know, maybe matchmaking or, or something. But um, the guy that ran it in Liverpool used to be my manager. Right, um, right. And I, I fought in that venue a bunch of times. So we've got good connections with the guys. But he spoke to us a couple of times about it so I think when it comes to Glasgow it'll be excellent because um, they've, they've got a bit of money about them they've got a bit of clout because of the they're, they're coming obviously for boxing for MTK mm-hmm. Global and boxing as well um, so it's a, it'll be a good addition to the kind of Scottish MMA scene when they do come here Aye, and something you said there as well about <coughs> in terms of how the show ran if you're a spectator point of view I like when a show's run like that I like when it's just fight after fight after fight some shows you go in I won't name any shows but you'll get a fight and then you get stupid shit happening in between it and that and it just aye and it just ends up being like you're there for four hours and half the show isn't fights so it's it's, because I want to rinse the bar (laughs) (laughs) it's just a it's a prolonged dragged out experience but I I quite like that setup that it's in and it's just you're there to see fights and they're they're rolling at one after do you think that makes it more sort of fan friendly as well especially with regional shows it definitely does, I think. Uh, you get a momentum going that way. Um, and then and then it, it just makes it the whole experience of the night better. Sometimes you get, at some of these other shows you get a couple good fights and then you've got you've got dancers in the cage or a self defence demonstration or a body raff or and then it's like, it kills the momentum. But as with that card at the weekend the the position the 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 fights in a way as well where it was like you were getting the better fighters coming on later on so Justin was on was the last amateur fight and it was like the two best amateur guys on the card mm-hmm. Good, two good guys for good gyms so you got like an excellent fight and then it moved on to the pro guys and then as you were getting further and further up the bill I ended up with with Brett and Tony who are both like they're, they're both super experienced heavyweight guys at the, at the top yet so it, it definitely affects the momentum and, and even the enjoyment of the night for the guys sitting in the crowd because the start stop thing's terrible Ah, yeah, as it's don't get me wrong. If you're working the media side and you're doing post fight, it can be handy. But if you're actually sitting there to enjoy your show, yeah. But what was the weirdest thing you've seen? That obviously I've seen cars getting raffled at shows. A car that literally needed the anti to win. What was the weirdest thing you've seen happening at a fight show? We were at a show. This was even before Justin. Where uh, it's actually coincidentally, they've not been far off in nine eleven. But we were at a show in, a, in the south, uh, the north of England. Sorry. And it was in an army barracks, this show, and uh, there was a self-defence demonstration halfway through the show where it was a guy doing things like breaking slabs in his belly and stuff like that, like <laughs> sledgehammers and stuff like that. But because we're in this, like, army base, I think at Catterick Garrick, there's some guy shouting about ragheads and all that stuff, and we're like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, like just put the fights on, let us get out of here. But I, this guy came out and it was like... It was like he's doing stunts, he was breaking slabs there, he's seeing setting things on fire and cratty chopping and stuff. And then they're like, having to clear the, the this was in a box ring, it was that far back, but then they had to clear the box ring out and then bring in the next fight. But 
So that, that was probably the weirdest thing I've seen. How, how do you discover you can do that shit? Is that just a bad DIY, DIY experience going wrong? My dad used, used to do stuff out of the back when he was drunk when I was a wee guy. <laughs> <laughs> Crack a chop the fence up. <laughs> so maybe it's something to do with booze, I don't know. Oh, well, I, that's, that, that could play a big part in it. So overall, uh, the show was then good, obviously, again, apart from the result of Justin's fight. The performance was good, so I, I don't mind him losing if he performs well. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some stuff different with this camp. He'd, we're working with a strength conditioning coach called Jonathan Payne, who's been working with Billy Joe Saunders. Um, and he was, he's been brilliant for Justin. He was excellent. Like He was, he was really on point, super de- uh, detailed in his approach and stuff like that. So... Uh, We've got like that, that was our first kind of run out with him working mm-hmm. with Justin and it was everything that's came off it's been been excellent so far but the performance was good so we're, we're happy with that he's, he's showed improvements for his last couple of fights and, and he's moving in the right direction When you see that at the, um, obviously with your amateur fighters is that is that the main thing for you is that, don't you how they perform and you seeing things that maybe they can improve on? Uh, I, the performance is everything eh? performance is absolutely everything with these guys the People get up, the results are obviously important and stuff, but the mm-hmm. results are only sometimes an indicator of how, yeah, yeah. how you're progressing. There's performance and, and trying to improve on the performance or, or keep matching the same level of performance is, is, is what's important there. Eh? Aye, and, and for you, Justin, with the new addition of strength and conditioning coach, how much of a difference did you feel? Uh, sorry, that was him at the door. He's like, Carl, I'm just going to fill and I took his keys <laughs> I forgot to give him back. <laughs> so then, you know, I'll probably get muddled for that in a session next week, so it's all right. Nah, I can't even thank Jonathan enough. It just kind of came to start working with him like, on a whim. He was in the gym one day and I started, I was kind of thought, I was talking to him about the, Burgess, the, the experience working with Burgess Saunders and Tyson Fury and stuff and like, what it was like and what kind of stuff he would do and I just kind of dropped, it was, I was basically blagging it. Like when mm-hmm. I asked him, I was like, oh, if you've got any time or that, uh, would you mind doing some work with me? Mm-hmm. And he was like, I need bother, that's cool. Uh, I didn't expect him to kind of say aye. aye. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, uh, fuck it aye brilliant let's do it and then it's everything he's done for me I've just like, all the programming and that he's done he's, he's had me doing stuff I've never done before really mm-hmm. and he said but I'm quite a nosy and like, inquisitive person so everything he's had me doing I've been asking him why and asking for breakdowns and why I'm doing it and like he's just been explaining it to me and I've, I've, that's the best I've ever actually felt on the run up right through a camp Aye. Right into walking into the cage, hearing him, especially hearing him with his own fight day and that as well was pretty, was cool. All the way, it was, it was there for the start of the camp, all the way through to, to the end, basically to, to the fight night. And I've, I've, it's the best I've ever felt, and, I, and I'm really looking forward to moving forward with working with him, mate, because it's, I can only see me get going from strength to strength working with him. Because it's, it's the fastest I've ever felt, it's the best, uh, fastest I've ever felt, the fastest I've I felt a lot faster and a lot more explosive mm-hmm. and stuff like that and I felt like I had a lot, I had a lot more I could have done another five rounds after, after the three on Saturday I felt that good so it was, I'm really excited to look to work with him going forward it's a massive thing like so if anybody is looking to kind of add a strength conditioning coach to that to the game and they can add, I wouldn't I'd recommend Jonathan or anybody else When you're, when you're seeing the improvements leading up to the fight as well I'd assume it just raises the confidence going into the cage as well. Aye, of course. Like the last week, it's, it's training like the fight week. I like, guess I was on a Monday night and Tuesday night, and I was hitting pads, and I was like, normally Monday, Tuesday night, the fight week, you're you're dead. Aye, I felt amazing, man. Like, I was hitting pads, I was like, I was flying. Huh? I was like, I, I was like proper like excited. Normally, just you're like it's almost dragging your heels a wee bit. You can be on fight week because you're like, oh, I'm not going to be eating much. Oh, I've got this weight to make, right? How much water have I drank today, right? If you're water loading, it's like, right, I need to make sure I've to make sure I'm not taking any salt. But another thing I, I can say about that camp there as well, like the camp couldn't have went any better. I've started working with a meal prep company as well called Balance Bistro, they're based in Livingston. And the cool thing for me is they're willing to tie in with Jonathan mm-hmm. as well. So Jonathan's basically on the last especially the last two or three weeks of camp, he was kinda tailor suiting my the macros in my meals to the purpose of what I'm being Aye. I'll be doing these days and they've just been making them with suits like Carla I can't thank Carla enough she's just been tying in and 
basically she's basically been my, been a chef for me for the last two or three weeks, especially the last couple of weeks of camp. And Jonathan's just been telling her, Gina, figures to hit per meal, figures to hit per day, and she's just then it on basically smashing it apart. It takes takes a lot of pressure off fighters and that is that as well. So they having to meal prep every night or every couple of days and stuff like that as well. And the food's all it all tastes good. It doesn't even feel like you're that you're dying, you know you're dying. <laughs> ah, like, yeah. I, I'm not gonna like need they can lie about that. Like, oh, you can cut weight without feeling like you're dieting. That's a lie. Mm-hmm. Like, you know you're dying. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> but it's enjoyable because you're you're reaping the benefits in your performances and training, as you're recovering better between sessions because you're you're fueling your body right. I will watch that, and it must be better. I mean, I heard was it Callum Yuri used to use uh, Weight Watchers meals. What do you mean used to? What do you mean used to? He bought that Joe Wicks Lean in 15 book and he's been posting it every night for the past two weeks since he's got it. <laughs> so, so James, would you, would you recommend <laughs> Weight Watchers then for, for fighters uh, dieting? No, definitely not. I don't know why he's doing that. It's probably getting, getting too full <laughs> pricey one or something. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. right. Yeah, all the boys love a bargain, like. Yeah, right, well, there you go. Maybe you can, uh, maybe you can out call them up and get my way for the Weight Watchers meals. Uh, by the way, it looks like no bad chef. So. <laughs> ah, well, it looks aye. all right. Aye. It looks aye. all right. He's had the same meal three times the past two weeks, but I've not. I've, it's because he's single. He's, 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 he's recently recent became single, so he's in shape. Yeah. Ah, so, right, so right, that, right, right. He is yeah. in shape, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he's in shape. <something> <laughs> Uh, so that's what, that, so if there's going to be any way to get a guy to get in shape it's probably that get them oh, aye. get them to be uh, single that'll, yeah. that'll sort them out um, so mo- just moving on for the MTK uh, uh, card obviously the gym itself that we're sitting in the now that's that's just about a year now you've been in the premises so has it been a quick year? aye it's been fast man you don't get a minute to it's constant evolving eh? you're just like we've had like, even you guys were here a year ago for the open mm-hmm. day and stuff, but you, you've seen it yourself, it's evolved. Um, we've tweaked bits and pieces and there's a load of new guys in and, and stuff like that, but it's, it's went in fast, it's been it's been hectic, I can't get a minute to, to stop, which is good. But uh, it's, been a, it's been a fairly successful year, but it's been fast. Aye, and that's something you've said there as well, there's new guys added in in that as well, so over the year, of course, uh, the actual fight team itself, how much has that grown and improved as well since moving into new premises? Just having that extra space to work as well. We've, uh, I think, we lost a couple of fighters, like guys that, that have moved on or, mm-hmm. or retired and stuff, but I think we're still at 30, 31 um, active. But the big thing I've noticed in, in the last six months or so, we've got this wee group of guys who are, they're about 15, 16, uh, there's maybe six of them now or seven and they guys are coming through um, and they're all now at that stage where they're like you need to get me a fight you need to get me a fight a couple of them have got their blue belts in jiu-jitsu now um, they're doing inter clubs and, and stuff like that but it's like we've got our next wee wavy guys to come through um, so that that's the, the thing I've noticed that it's these kids and you're like Jesus Christ look what they've got the world at their feet because they've mm-hmm. got they're in here and they've got they've got Stevie and Danny and Graham Turner and and guys who have been here for for years like giving them details and tips and stuff like that and it's just they've, they've got a, they've, obviously the facility is going to help but they've got access to knowledge that, that a lot of guys don't have. And that's it. And I guess it's like anything else through MMA. The levels just keep increasing and increasing it's just yeah. to see have you noticed as well obviously when you started it was, wasn't it yesterday a wee while back um, you noticing the kids that are coming in are a lot they're getting younger and younger that are actually starting in MMA not necessarily maybe just Jiu Jitsu yeah. we um, we never really bothered with kids programmes before until we moved here we put the we've got kids uh, Jiu Jitsu with Wayne and Justin takes the Thai class so they, we were using that for like 5 to 11s and then anything over that we're putting them through the adults but the, some of the kids coming up are frightening like you've seen Sean Clancy fight a couple of times yeah, and he's yep. still 16 um, and he's, he's he's running some of the adult guys ragged now eh? he's, he's 16 year old he comes in and he's blazer and stuff like that and he's he's getting in trouble for not doing his homework sometimes and then he's he's messaging me on a Friday night is it, it alright if I go to the cinema tonight with my pals and stuff like that I'm like <laughs> you're fucking 16 like, do what you want like Aye. you need to be doing that stuff but the kids are every, every good gym in, in the country the kids coming through should be they'll be better than the, the guys that went before them if they're doing things right that's the way they should be here. Um, and that, that's what we've always found here and I guess as well that that then just shows that it's going, we're going to see a better product, product in the regional scenes as well yep. Um and for you this 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 year you've had what's been the biggest challenges you've faced? 
Uh, just the time man- the time management stuff. Um, I had a baby in that year period as, mm. as well, um, and then just the, the coaching bit's fine. It's just trying to ma- it's like man managing thirty people, and then plus the other seventy students that are here, seventy plus students. Um, I'm lucky. I've got some. I've got some good coaches. They've, they've brought up a. I put in place coaching programs like a few years back where I had guys accumulating hours of coaching so look Justin and, and Martin Russell and, and Cammy Donnell who's there at Danaher's just now they, they'll coach but I, I marked down how many hours I've coached so mm. I know like Martin Russell was like 85 hours of, of live coaching like supervising and, and Justin's like well up past 100 now so I was then almost like running like an apprenticeship and then I gave them feedback on how they're coaching and stuff mm-hmm. like that as well and, and you can see them obviously I want them to be their own type of coach but you can see them developing into coaches now so it means when, when I'm away like I'm I'm due to go to Singapore with Stevie uh, possibly for two weeks I know the gym's in good hands with the guys that I've left back um, it's not like I've just found that you've been here the longest you need to take the classes like I know everybody who turns up is going to learn after the, the guys I leave back to, to cover C- Can you see in the, the guys that are in gym can you see in some of the guys that there's there's a good coach in there or they've got the potential to coach can you sort of see in a fighter who, which guys are suited to coaching and maybe what guys aren't uh, you can usually see it pretty quick uh, and then even on top of that some guys are some guys are good at working one to one some guys are good at taking groups but the, the way I've always thought about coaching was there's, there's you need two types of coaches in a gym of this size you need a a participation coach you need somebody who can run a class and people can come in after work and, and do an hour of Thai boxing and get better at Thai boxing and go home but you also need performance coaches which is what, what you need to be when you're working with fighters so mm-hmm. you, you need to make sure you differentiate what one's what you can't have a performance coach running a class uh, uh, guys who are what, just a workout on a Friday night before they, they're off for the weekend like they obviously you need a wee balance where they are getting better at the technique and, and stuff like that but some some guys can do the participation thing like they're, they're really good with people they've got a lot of energy their communication skills are good and stuff like that they just don't understand the performance side of it yeah. and then vice versa you'll get guys that can can add stuff to your game just with a couple of words or, or showing you something um, but if you say to them I can't make the 8 o'clock class tonight there's 40 people coming for jiu-jitsu can you take the class they'll be like oh, I'm not doing that like, <laughs> fuck that so it's, it's trying to find the it's like everything else it's trying to find the right guy for the right job type of thing but so, some guys are it's, a, it's completely different skill sets for fighting some of the best coaches are weren't great fighters and stuff like that and, and vice versa but um, you can definitely see it Aye and for your point of view as well just not obviously for the coaching side and for you know, being an active fighter in the gym which which you've been experienced like moving to this facility and just how this year's went for you Oh it's, it's class man it's like it's, for just even just training in the gym it's like mm-hmm. The we yell them out there's this this, this the mat area we used to hear. like that's what we had them up on. So now we've got that times three basically because yeah. the blue area is double the yellow, and plus we've got a cage now as well, which is a massive. I think that's a massive boost for us. A lot of gyms still didn't have full size cages on them, mm-hmm. and it's like see, I think you notice a lot more <coughs> with, with, with guys for our team when they're fighting. We're a lot more aware of where we are. No, um, it's it's a total different ball game. Like working against a cage, a, a cage wall, like an actual physical cage wall, than actually fighting in a cage against mm-hmm. if, against defence. Because if you're against the cage wall, it's it's a straight line. Whereas if you're in the cage, the the fence is sh- is chamfered at all. It's all angled, so it's, you're getting different feedback of different bits of defence and stuff like that. And it's it's, it's crazy, man. It's like. It's just, I think it's helped everybody in the gym to get better moving to a bigger facility it's, it brought a proper buzz this time last year when we were all getting ready but move out here it was like this is going to be class this is going to be amazing and the first remember the first cut of sessions it's like fucking hell this is, this is minty man I can't believe this is actually be, this is our gym uh-huh. and then it's like we're going for like <laughs> like a wee walking area with all the benches with everybody's stuff just fucking smashed everywhere like four hours stuff right onto the mats and like one wee toilet and on this we blew my like you're busy with about 15 folk in it 20 folk in it we had 40 <laughs> sometimes you know what I mean and I, can then, a, I can imagine that toilet might not have been a pretty sight at times it wasn't actually too bad no? no it was funny when folk went in the shower box the shower used to always go hot and cold <laughs> <laughs> so it's like but it was cool man it's like you can't just you can't jump into a facility this side just 
it's a credit to the James, he's coaching ability and I, it just shows how many, there's a lot of guys came out of fellow gyms since mm-hmm. moving here, since even in the old gym as well, kind of starting to come out just before we moved here. And when we, when we moved here, we had a few other new guys come, like active fighters for other gyms coming to train with us. It's not just for the facility, it's for obviously for, for the coaching, for, mm-hmm. for James's knowledge and experience because it's no. So you didn't get that everywhere else, especially right. being in the mix with guys like Stevie and Danny, and especially with Graham, with Graham and that being back to years. Like Graham's probably the most experienced Scottish pro fighter still, and he's no fought in three or four years, isn't he? So it's like you're not going to get much more knowledge and and fighting than half a guy who you're training with, is it like right. like Graham or a coach like James. You know, you, there's no many. In fact, I don't think there's any other gym in Scotland with that kind of knowledge on the mat every day. Aye, so and for me coaching as well it's been pretty cool we've done a couple of wee things with kids the kids class like in the old gym but it was different it was not like a proper programme we've done like kind of tested the water a wee bit and then when we came here we started a proper kids programme and it's and it's took off like it's, it's proper enjoyable too. I enjoy coaching mm-hmm. I do enjoy coaching kids I enjoy coaching adults so I enjoy, they started doing all their PTs and stuff too so it's I enjoy coaching like Joe Bloggs like the average guy who mm. wants to come in and get a bit fitter and I've got a couple of guys who actually fight I coach as well the younger guys and some guys just come in a hot pass and stuff too it's kind of good fun it's Aye. good fun it helps me learn too it helps me pick up stuff in my technique and it makes you really especially teaching kids you, you, the big thing I find with teaching kids you need to make sure you get them bang on with their technique for the get go because you get pick them up at 11, 12 13, 14, they've maybe done a bit of this and a bit of that elsewhere. And they come into the gym and they've already got bad habits. Mm-hmm. But if you're teaching them for, f- for five, six, seven year old, they do nothing. And you teach them correctly. It's, there's, there's a couple of kids I've got in the class that do the, the, the tie energy. So, like, two wee girls, like, they're twins, the nicest wee last year I've met in life. But see, by the time they're 16, 17, they're going to be absolutely killers. Because what the <laughs> I said they clean this te- better technique than me for kicking and punching and kneeing and then when they're doing jitsu and that as well it's like there's a broad spectrum right across all the kids they're all even in my classes and Wayne's classes a lot of them do both mm-hmm. and the technique and some of the stuff they're doing it's like at such a young age it's like wow man it's like what was I doing at that age I think I was running about still eating worms and that and climbing <laughs> trees and things like that do you know what I mean like, <laughs> I guess there must be Especially with the kids, there must be a rewarding thing as well because we, when they come in and you, you see them progressing and uh, see them progressing and, and some kids maybe gaining more confidence and I'm assuming that's something you're noticing as they're coming more and more to your classes and that. There's a wee guy in my class um, and in the first couple of weeks he's been coming, he's come, came every single session apart from two when he was on holiday this summer. He's, and when he first came in he was a wee shy guy like he wouldn't even talk to me when I was trying to talk to him like explaining things to him and stuff like that and like he's, when he first came in he's coordinating like he was a bit the coordination that was a bit with all the places as it is when you're a kid as right. well I think I still think okay, my left my right for half the time sometimes but then see now when you see him you can tell he's been here and his mum's even told me that like, he runs through his man and dad he's only like seven mm-hmm. and he goes through his man and dad like, at the weekends with I tell his dad to hold the pad for him and that's so where he can practice and see now see his, his technique especially the last couple of weeks there is you can tell he's been practicing because he's, every time he's doing it he's nailing everything he's doing he's so nailing it all the time he's still this wee quiet shy guy but you can see now his confidence and actually perform, like doing things in training he's coming out his shell a wee bit and he's properly starting to enjoy it because like, they start with I was like is this wee guy enjoying this like, because mm-hmm. you could tell he felt maybe a bit uncomfortable and stuff but you can see now in him that he's, he's properly enjoying it and he's smiling away he's saying when he's doing things because um, so it's a great feeling for me to see them come out of the shell a wee bit and kind of uh, start to enjoy it more because you can you know what it's like when you ever start doing anything like you, when you start playing football or going to a boxing class or even when people go into the gym to lift weights or when you start progressing you start it's just like a self gratitude thing like aye, self, it's rewarding aye, aye it's a rewarding thing you start going oh I'm actually alright at this aye. and you can see it in these wee these wee like, boys and lassies like you can see them as they're gaining confidence and they're getting getting a bit more like self belief in their self and they're like oh I can actually do this and it's the cool thing is as well when you start seeing them actually correcting their self Mm-hmm. Like when the field of done, done something a wee bit no too right, and before you get a chance to correct them, you can see them be like, oh, and like fixing it and then doing it again straight away, 
and nailing it. And it, that that's pretty cool. I think that's one of the most rewarding things for me. Like, see when you actually start seeing them picking it up as well and, and correcting their aim technique because you know they've no quite straightened the leg right or they've no quite turned it off too much and they're actually asking their partner like what oh, can I do that like let me do that again uh, must, but must be scary to think as well these kids that are coming in at that young age if they just stay the course as well oh, it's like they're going to, how they're going to develop once they hit the, the teen years and uh, the likes of like Sean Clancy when did Sean Sh- Sean start what age was, what age was he's Sean he's been here since he was 14 but um He's I, I used to train, his dad trained with us and stuff like this, so he's, he's probably been Sean's been training since he's probably could walk he's, he's got I think he's got like four or five wee brothers and they're all the same that his dad when Sean's in here his dad will be on the other mat with, with the, the two wee ones and they're like fucking punching and kicking and stuff already so he's, he's been running about it for a while but it's like he's been since he started taking it serious it's been about 14 but he he, like, like Justin said, he, he already had a good grounding and stuff, but um, he had a couple of wee habits to iron it. But he's he's at that age now where he's starting to develop. You can see his styles starting to match his personality a wee bit. Do, uh, do you think he's one of the... So I've obviously seen Sean fighting, and the first time I've seen him fighting, it was, it's hard to take in his age. He, he actually fought, he was, was that a headhunter's fight? He was actually yeah. fighting one of the... Was one of the Brock twins? One of the twins. Who are over here training now as well. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was pretty scary to think he was... He was only 15. The three of them at the time were all like 15. There's Aye. a kid up in Aberdeen as well at uh, Aberdeen Combat Centre, I think the same. I can't remember the kid's name. Uh, is it not this, this? I'm sort of sorry if I forget your name. I can remember because he fought in Headhunters as yeah. well, didn't he? He's fought uh, the other, the other the time. Aye, that but, was um, it. Yeah, they, the, the four of those kids at, at that age are excellent. Eh? They've got the world at their feet again. Like, they're, they're really good. Yeah, at least it's, it's good to know that. that they've, you get young kids all right around the country. It's just Scottish MMA is not and a good place going forward and just over the course of this year as well has there any been has there been any highlights that stuck out for you anything in particular that stuck in your mind that's been a particular high point this year um, just that the, just everything kind of gelling at the gym has been pretty cool like mm-hmm. um, the people we've had a lot of people in visiting this year and stuff which has been pretty cool we'd we obviously had Mark Clinton that time and then uh, Jodie Escobel was in for Jackson's um, and stuff like that it's been pretty cool but it's just to me it's just the same as always it's just like one night one kind of night's training at a time it's like mm. I'm, I don't really think too far ahead that's why I got asked I was speaking to Paddy Houlihan recently about an issue with a belt in the gym like why uh, I think the issue is if a fighter leaves your gym and he's got a belt up on the wall do you let them take the belt and I was like well I don't have any belts in the gym. I was like, when guys in here win a belt, they can bring it in and show people it. But, mm-hmm. And then I want them to take it away. And I want the reasoning for that is, I don't want people to come in and look at the belts and be like, oh, look what these guys have won. I'm always like, what can we win next? I want the mm-hmm. next belt. Or I don't want to think about what I've done previously. It's all about next and next and next. So that that's the way it is we, we end here and now. It's like, I, I'm not settled here. Like I need to, I'm always looking for things to push forward. Uh, whether it's, coaching style or bringing guys in to help us or, or like putting that song in to help with the recovery stuff or, or getting in touch with the, the meal prep guys and, and it's, we're always just looking about to, to stay advancing and keep keep pressing forward so it's been a good year in terms of everybody's progressed as a martial artist that, mm-hmm. that goes right for the guys who it's, it's obvious who are competing and putting stuff on the line it's, it's easy to see them progress but you're, there's also a a big massive group of students here who you, they're not competing so it, I can see them progress I can see them maybe winning roles or they're, they're getting on better in life they're happier in life so that that's always going to be the, the main thing for me is to see people being like oh I've had a shit day at work um, I've, I've fallen out with this guy I've got this this and that going on I've came in and trained and I feel much better I'm going to go and tackle it um, that, that's always like the, that's more progression for me than some guy winning a belt or, or some guy winning a fight. I guess the other thing as well is obviously a lot of, lot of times with MMA gyms you focus on the fight team but a lot of MMA gyms it's not, a, it's not a fight team that keeps an MMA gym going it's a, it's a average guy in the street coming through the doors and I guess that's that's a big risk when you move gyms especially going up to a bigger facility it's, it is, it's taking a gamble and I'm assuming that's something that's been pleasing for you as well to see the classes are busy and, and, yeah. and, the, and that for that side of things. I, th- I was aware of the fact that like you don't pay the bills with fighters eh? mm-hmm. it's, it's, as much as I love it and stuff 
Um, you can't just cater to them. I've seen guys make that mistake before, and a lot of gyms that aren't even about anymore because of that mistake. Mm-hmm. And they've felt a bit. So, it's, again, it's trying to create a balance where you're catering for everybody, but at the same time, if you're just catering for guys who are coming in and not fighting, your fighters aren't going to do very well. There's two different... It's that performance and participation thing again. Mm-hmm. Eh? It's two different groups. For the fighters need... There's, we have closed door sessions in here that's only for the fighters and they, occasionally some of the, the guys who train during the week will stay back and watch them in the boy group. Oh, yeah. That's why they're fighters and that oh, yeah. But it's it's getting that balance but you need to it needs to cater for everybody. Like it, It's no... Um, working with fighters is stressful as well. You wouldn't want to just work with them as much as I, I love it and stuff but as I'm getting older I'm starting to see right this is there's more benefits in this for everybody that was why we, we brought in the kids programs and, and stuff like that it was before it was when you come in at, a, at the old higher level any night of the week there's 20 fighters on the mat and like three or four normal kind of guys just in to try and keep up them working out um, but it's now try to cater for both I guess the other thing for the uh where it helps having big name fighters in as well for the an average guy coming in you just maybe want to get better and fitter to go in there and maybe see a Danny Henry or, or, or a Stevie Ray or whoever it might be and you're just maybe on, on the same mat as them yeah. obviously maybe not directly training with them but that is definitely a good thing for the gym and it's good for people to come in and do that especially if they're MMA fans as well I try and make the guys that, like Stevie and Danny are, are really quick to help guys like that anyway mm-hmm. I make if they didn't volunteer to do it I would make them do it because it's good for them um, you need to give back you always need to give back um, but they're, they're, they're really quick to like if they see somebody struggling they're, they'll go there and spend time with them eh? which is cool it, it's something I've noticed just in MMA as a whole especially coming from the media side of things like I, I was thinking if I was working let's say in football media and I was trying to contact Premiership players and that for interviews chances of getting them are pretty slim I always feel like MMA fighters are more accessible than most other sports um, and that's I guess that's applies to what I was saying here like guys can come in and, and train with Stevie Ray or train with Danny Henry yeah. do you think that's something that's maybe helped our sport as well the accessibility of fighters and I think with the, that's definitely a, a factor I think the timing of it coming through with, with social media and that mm-hmm. uh, blowing up like when I was 20 uh, if, if you asked me who my fighting heroes were it would have been like Raymond Deckers or, or like guys like this and there's no way I could have contacted them I wasn't going to get their phone number for their gym in Breda or something there's now it's like you can message these guys on Instagram or, or, or Twitter or anything there's a chance they might see it and just be like hey, I'm patching that but every now and again some of the guys get a wee message back eh? like we, I had that before I, I can't mind what I messaged on tw- it was in the early days of Twitter and I, I'd made some remark about the it was about Henner Gracie um, talking about how in his, his dad had created this daily fighting and all this stuff and I was like when when I was that age my dad was fucking hiding out in the back shed for my morning <laughs> but he, he messaged me back and stuff and I was yeah. like oh, that's pretty cool it's like Henner Gracie it's like but that that's I think the the accessibility has definitely came with the fact that the the athletes were craving access the, the access they wanted, mm-hmm. wanted recognition when a lot of mainstream platforms wanted to gain them it so they were having to get it through internet and, and stuff like that. So they would be quick to get back. I'll do an interview, I'll, I'll do a photo shoot, right. I'll, I'll do this. Whereas these more established sports, you'd have to go through agents and stuff and there's nothing for the guys to do it. But it's definitely the, the only sport where you, you can go. We've got that kid, uh, Cami, over in New York to now and he's, he's sending pictures of his role in the Gordon Ryan and Gary Tonin and stuff like that. Like every day he's there for like eight weeks training with these guys. But you wouldn't get that. And, like I couldn't rock up to to Celtic and, and get a, a place in the midfield next to Scott Brown for a kick about. Like, <laughs> it just wouldn't happen. I think for a wee while there you you were you weren't doing anywhere interviews with me, so I think you thought I was jinxing you. I don't know who I'm fighting next. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, well, no, this isn't an interview. Nah, this nah, is a, nah, so do, just for anybody watching this, I think we, I'd interviewed you. <laughs> for anybody watching this, do not do an interview with James Hamlin before you fight <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever do it. <laughs> I have noticed since I've not done interviews with you, all your fights have seemed to go ahead. Aye, aye. So, so maybe there is something. Earlier. Maybe I'm just a jinx for you. It's just me. I am a black sheep, man. <laughs> But uh, so all, all in looking back here the year, it's been a really good year. It's been fast. I don't know what everybody always says that, but aye, it's been it's been productive. I can't uh, believe it's been only a year already. Aye, the, the, the levels, <laughs> everyone's increased, which is what we want. None's none's stagnated. Aye, that's it. And I guess it's just 
the future's bright in going forward. Yeah. And so one other thing I wanted to talk about is obviously we know we did your fight uh, just past here, but we had a big card in the UFC, uh, yeah. 242. So jump straight in with the headliner, Khabib Poirier. I had quite high hopes for this fight. I still felt Khabib would win, but I don't know how you felt looking back on the fight. I was a wee bit, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was a wee bit disappointed. I thought Dustin would maybe be able to mo- do more, but I'm thinking maybe that's me just underestimating Khabib like a lot of people do. What, what do you think of the performance and, and Dustin's approach and game plan to the fight, James? Yeah, I, th- I don't think he performed well. I don't know what hit on the guy when he's down and stuff, but... Mm. If, if you're looking at fighting Khabib I'm, he knows this and Mike Brown knows it as well you can't let him get you near that fence right. like, that's the first thing that anybody is preparing for him has to deal with and he didn't even make it hard getting backed up against the fence eh? he, it, I think Justin's obviously knew this but um, it's like before you knew it he was on the fence um, I didn't uh, there's some stuff before in the Alvarez fight where Alvarez backed him up to the fence and Dustin was jumping on the guillotine and getting up top position and I think doing that way we could be suicidal um, I think actually Cop McGregor done a better job on the fence than Dustin did to be fair um, I I knew I, I had Khabib to win I mm-hmm. thought pretty comfortable I thought best case scenario they went to points and Dustin, I thought Dustin would maybe take an absolute beating um, I think he when, he when he put everyone into that guillotine Nice. It's just been like, right, that's that's him done now, that's him by, and, and then he's obviously come out and choked him. But the the run he'd been on before that was tremendous. Like Dustin, I think he'd be Alvarez, Holloway, Pettis, uh, and some other really good guy. Was it Barboza, maybe? Aye. We beat, beat four of the, the, the top, top guys, but they were all strikers. So, uh, other than, uh, Gaethje, 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 sorry. Gaethje, other than the, the wrestling exchanges with Eddie Alvarez, he hadn't faced that, that wrestling style until I get in there with Khabib and I think he, he's he got that thing where you get in there with him and you can't prepare for it until you get in there and he, he gets a hold of you you're like oh, oh, this is different do, do you think there's no it's not just a, it's not just Khabib's physical attributes do you think at this point maybe taking Tony Ferguson out of this I don't think it would affect him do you think there's a a mental thing fighters need to get over Mike when they're getting there approach, you know, it's, uh, it's just Tyson. like you, you know what he's going to do but he's and, and, and I've read as well a, a few folk posting he's a born fighter I personally don't think he's a born how fighter I think what he does I, is because he crushes guys it's, how can I think people how can anybody think <coughs> he's born no, he takes everything you're good at away from you mm-hmm. and makes you and treats you like a wee doll you see when he fought Michael Johnston he was saying to him don't let him, don't like, just ski up don't want to, I don't want to hurt you it's my time like, what, hi, it's, like, I don't want to like, how, how demoralising is that when a guy's on top of you controlling you and there's nothing you can do about it aye it's <laughs> I, I would imagine Khabib is a guy that for guys he's fought to rematch him would be psychologically very difficult depending on how mentally tough you are but getting knocked out is one thing you get caught you can maybe say right I can do this or I can do but that but getting manhandled I, absolutely like, crushed just I just like con- controlled like you're a child like, mm. there's nothing you see when, when he fought Barboza like, when he held Barboza down you see Barboza's face Aye. it's like what kind of strength is that like, what does that feel like to be held down like that because you can see it in him it's just like what What the fuck can I do here what do I do it's the way he gets guys you see when he gets the guys legs underneath him and he just pulls the legs in as well and they just can't they've just got it takes their legs away from them it um, immobilises you don't it sticks your hips to the flare and then if your hips are your hips are only moving and you can't you can't manoeuvre the rest of your body. Aye, and there was one stage in the fight as well. Obviously, Dustin did catch him, but Dustin then really, because I thought the heat in Abu Dhabi as well would play a part for both guys, obviously. But I thought Dustin threw a few, quite a few wild punches, and I don't know if that zapped him as well. Then obviously with, with the guillotine. Um, do, do you think there was a way for Dustin to win that fight? Do you think he had a skill set that could overcome Khabib? I think so. I think you need to be really disciplined. There is ways to beat him. Like mm-hmm. um, The first thing you need to do is... And there's evidence there if you watch his, his previous fights. The good, the good thing with, the, with fighting at, at that level is it's like a scientific experiment. It's like mm-hmm. you, you go back and look at evidence and you find what works and what does. Then and He's never been beat. But there's guys have had some success against them doing certain things. And the first thing you need to, to look at is how how he's getting in these dominant positions, and it always involves the fence. If you can't get if you can't get backed up to the fence, then half his game goes away. But if you look at the 
the Alaquinta fight, for example, he'd, he'd done Alaquinta real easy in the first round or two with taking him down against the fence. And then after that, he never got back near the fence. And all his, all his shots in open space, Alaquinta defended. I, I can't mind the number, but he, it was like maybe 14. He had 14 takedown attempts, and I think 11 of them he stopped. And it was just like turning out and limp leg and single and stuff like that. So I think the first thing you've got to do there is take that away, the, the fence away, because his whole game is based on getting you down there against the fence. Um, there's a, there's some stuff going on with, with, with Jack Slack, actually. He's, he reckons that the, he, he has a, his analysis, famous analysis, Aye. probably the best guy. Uh, really, really good stuff. Podcast and stuff, but he reckons that the the way to beat that kind of fence style that Khabib's doing and Usman, uh, Volkanovski, Covington... Uh, there's, there's other there's Gregor Gillespie there's guys at every weight using that style he reckons it's not to have your head near the fence when they take you down to try and turn your head to the centre of the space and then start employing like butterfly guard and, and more kind of jiu-jitsu style stuff which is it's an interesting idea but again it involves that uh, you have to kill the fence like if you mm-hmm. get near the fence with the guys he's going to murder you um, the other thing I think is the only guy that he's, that he's competed against who can match him physically uh, to this day is Gleason Tebow, who is just was, as big and as strong, good grappler. And if you, it's that's Khabib's asterisk that fight. That was a, there was, that was talk. A, was that his, one of his first ones? It was early on, yeah. but it, it was like I, I, I watched the fight um, recently and he definitely won it, but it was the closest fight he's had in the UFC because nobody else has been able to compete with him physically. Dustin was definitely not going because he was fighting at featherweight mm-hmm. up until the, the corner fight. And he's a good size lightweight and stuff like that, but Khabib is an absolute monster for, for lightweight and he's athletic, he's so fast. You see it when he's in corners, like super fast. And the, with Khabib in corner, you can, there's no a speed difference. You're like, right, he's fast, like he's, he's just as quick. And then obviously he's strong. And then if you let him get in that, that space near the fence, you're, there's nothing in your favour there. He's systematically got you where he wants him. He's a better athlete than he's, he knows your next move and he's, he's got something ready for it. Eh? Do you think there's a guy, obviously Tony, it would be a travesty if Tony Ferguson doesn't, I know McGregor had to call out, but I'd, I, I would much rather at this point see Tony, because that's a fight we've, they've been trying to make for ages. Um, do you think there's a guy in that lightweight division necessary, that hasn't fought him at the moment? So Tony, for example, even maybe looking at Justin Gaethje, do you think there's a guy in there that's got the, got the ability to beat Khabib? Uh, there's some interesting fights, I think. I don't think any of them beat him. I think Tony... Tony might have the best chance just because he, he's mental and he's, he's pace. <laughs> he's pace. Like he'll, he'll lose two or three rounds, but he'll still be going at that speed round four and five. And there's maybe a chance that Khabib slows down. I think Khabib still takes him down and holds him down and beats him because Tony, will, they keep going on about Tony playing off his back. He's happy to play guard and he's aggressive with his guard and stuff. But again, if you go back to looking for evidence in other fights, Kevin Lee took that. It was doing well against Tony yep. until he gassed and put himself in a triangle. And Khabib's not going to get. You seen it with that guillotine at weekend that you can put him in these super deep subs, and he'll, he'll find a way out of them. He'll, he'll wait them out. But the Tony fight's interesting just because Tony will not get tired. Um, I would like to see the Gaethje fight. I think would be interesting, but mm-hmm. he gets tired. He's he's bad for slowing down. Yeah, and he's, already, man right enough. he's already he's already lost to, to guys. That are nowhere near Khabib's level. The other interesting fight would be the Gregor Gillespie, the guy who's ranked number 11. He's flying under the yep. radar a wee bit. He fought in, when Stevie fought in Brazil, he was with us. Him and his coach were in our change room and stuff like that. And he's, I think he's like, he's a, a national wrestling champion, Division uh, 1. He quit wrestling because his, his closest rival in the American team and stuff was this guy, Jordan Burroughs, who's yep. like multiple times Olympian, world champion. So Gillespie's moved over to MMA. But he's, he's excellent, eh? and he's, he's wrestling's brilliant. His striking's really good. He trains at a good uh, kickboxing gym. Um, and he, but he's dead, he doesn't, he's dead quiet. He's one of the guys mm-hmm. that talks about fishing all the time when you see him Aye. in his post fight. But style wise, I think he could give could big problems. Um, I'd still pick could be to win, just because a bit naturally bigger. Um, and the other guy would be. Uh, this was for Polaris at uh, the weekend with Stevie. There was a guy in the main event at Polaris. Uh, Edwin Nijin his name is and he's rolled with Khabib mm-hmm. he's also rolled with a UFC lightweight called Davy Ramos who fought the weekend no. and he reckons that uh, Ramos could submit Khabib on the ground uh. Uh, Ramos has got some serious ADCC uh, BJJ credentials 
Um, um, but again, I think he lost at the weekend, didn't he, Ramos? Ah, uh, he did. He lost. I think it was a it was a pretty close fight, and it was against I forget. I'll mispronounce the guy's name, but I think he's Khabib's teammate. Is it Islam? Aye, uh, aye. But then he's yeah. he's then been touted as being the next yeah, next he's Khabib. Good. He's good. Next baby Khabib but, coming through. Yeah, I don't I don't think anybody that weight beats him. I think you'll need to. Move up, move um, up, and then maybe somebody who can match him physically, maybe. No, nah, because there's some obviously one seventy. He's got some some serious, seriously yeah. good wrestlers: Usman, yeah. Covington, and yeah. um, potentially a GSP return. And I think um, Gregor Gillespie. I think he actually called it Paul Felder. Yeah, yeah. which is we'll just jump right onto that one. Um, Paul Felder Barbosa, probably the most controversial, one of the most controversial fights in the card. Um, yep. A lot of people had scored it probably for Barbosa. I mean, oh, and I think we all won in that fight. It was a really, really good fight. Um, Do you think Barbosa had just edged it? Uh, I think with the 10-point must system, I scored it two rounds to one. I think if you scored it as a 15-minute fight, I'd have gave it to Felder because mm-hmm. that last round, I don't think he'd done enough in the last round for a 10-8 or anything, but I, f- I mind at the time thinking like Barbosa was two rounds up getting into the third. Um but it was close, and it's nice to see. I'll, I'll, I'm a fan of both guys, but uh, obviously with Stevie competing against Felder, and he was in Brazil as well. Spent some time with him. He's a he's a super cool guy, so it's mm-hmm. nice to see him get that decision. They may end up doing that again now because they're one each, and it's people's always going to watch the two guys fight because they're, they're exciting. Eh? They never get a bad fight with the two as well. Like no, they just both they both want it, man. But was is one of my favourite fighters ever, and then Felder's just, Felder's just nails, isn't he? He's just tough as they come and he's legit as well he's a jack slick striker as well and he's got power he's serious Aye. power like I can remember seeing him and he just you know, the way in he's like oh he's not that big and I can remember seeing him the next day and we were fighting there when he fought season I was like holy Aye, fuck he's a, he's a, he's a big, like, big legs man his legs are like fucking but he's, tree trunks he's flirted way well or as well didn't he he went up Aye, there to fight Perry. Mike, Mike Perry up there he's been the only right way I've seen so far it's made me think about Stevie dropping to featherweight I was like fuck aye think, but some big, there's some big guy and Barbosa's not a wee guy either no, and nah, they switch really. kicks and they kick so, but Paul Felder man. He, he seemed to be checking checking the kicks a bit more in the fight I noticed as well because yep. I, th- I, I thought um, what was it first round Barbosa threw a kick Felder checked it and it looked like Barbosa hurt his, hurt his foot because he seemed to stop throwing yeah yep. that's what you do with them just get the first check in early just get the guy second guessing it because nobody wants to slam their shin into a shin like that no and, and the other thing is you, you've got to do something with I mean when you stop two fights with leg kicks you cannot take the yeah, kicks, yeah. kicks you know it's answers. coming as well off of me uh, it was a uh, that, that for me was uh, that was the fight I most enjoyed on the night uh, was there any other fights in that in the card that stood out for you? the, the rest of the card was I thought it was quite Disappointing. It was like mm. it had all been built up for Khabib. It was like mm. it was like an it was like an occasion for Khabib. And it was like Aye. it was like when when you were a wee guy and Mike Tyson was fighting. You used to stay up late to watch Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson's going to kill somebody. It was like that that feeling. It was like this is Khabib. It's, it's Khabib's fight tonight, and it was like that. The rest, nothing really on the rest of the card cards too much. Um, I can't even remember a lot of the fights. The Makachev uh, Ramos fight was one I was really looking forward to. Cause I thought mm-hmm. that that would have been my pick for fight the night going in, and I thought it was super technical and stuff. It was pretty good, um, but it, it wasn't like the only thing I thought with Ramos is he, he's obviously quite thick, but he seemed he was quite small. So he's yep. about, he was five eight, and like you say, when you look at the size of some of the guys in that, that lightweight division, five eight is is diff- I mean even five eight for a featherweight, five Shorter. eight is probably short yeah. for a featherweight. Yeah. But it's just some guys have got that frame where it's just physically impossible to get down without absolutely destroying your body. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, no, there's some there, there's some big 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 lightweights and. Uh, the other thing this week as well that's come out, obviously a fight that I thought was going to definitely get done was Usman Covington, but that fight look, now looks like it's looks like it's away. Yeah, uh, it looks like Coving- it's not going to happen. Covington demanding money or something. Yeah. Yeah. Do, I, I quite like trash talking anyway, but I like the trash talking when it's kind of natural. And so, like early corner was funny, and I, I could get on board with that. Just but, off the off the whip, wasn't it? Aye. It's like, see when it's, I don't I don't like it's like the way Colby Covington's speaks of like how I don't I'm not big on the trash talk anyway it is funny and it builds all the hype and that but there's no need to be a fucking 
dick. Like, Aye. there's no need to be a complete dick. It's like, you're going to fight anyway. So, the eyes, it's good for a bit of back and forth to build a bit of hype, but you can build a bit of hype by, you can be respectful to each other and just have a bit of power and have a bit of banner. There's no need to start trying to, like, just downgrade people and be downright nasty to folk. There's Aye. no need for that. To me, that's usually a sign that your trash talk's no that good um, I think some guys are really suited to talking like that and they, should, they guys should definitely do it because it's entertaining but if you're not that if that's not in you but the one thing I did like about what happened with Covington is I quite like a fighter kind of knowing his worth and actually holding out and not being bullied by the promotion yeah, yeah that's um, pretty cool a lot of people have started doing that now as mm-hmm. well especially with it's, 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 well, to be fair it's Conor and stuff though Aye. Like, let's be 100% honest he's the one that kind of stood up for himself Talked his way. He didn't just talk to talk, he walked to walk to backed up what he was saying. Mm-hmm. But it, it was him who kind of gave fighters recognition and be like, well, wait a minute, we don't have to accept this money. Especially right. when I'm in the UFC, especially pulling out all the sponsor money. Mm-hmm. It's like, there was a lot of guys only getting paid like 10, 15, and 15 after UFC, but they're making 120, 130 grand for sponsors. Like, that's the livelihoods you're taking off them, like, and you're putting them down to a couple of, a couple of grand. For, because of where you're on a card and because it's just a, it's like a money for a, for a sponsor it's like it's not it's no good it's, especially for guys who for what you put into the sport as even guys at amateur level now like we're all a lot of, a lot of us are getting more sponsors and a lot of people are coming on board now because there's a lot more media attention on the sport mm-hmm. and it is, it's helping people but you're still you're not getting paid good money until you're at the top level of a sport and you, you rely on sponsors to kind of get by and help you like Aye. They, they, a lot of people have got families and stuff in that as well especially at that level in the UFC and stuff it's like they're, they're grown men <laughs> that, that's their life if they don't fight they don't they don't get paid so for them to take away their like a, a source of income for them it's kind of it's a fucking bit of kind of thief but it's, it has what it has in it they kind of try to uniform it and it has, has worked for some people it has it has any for others Mm-hmm. hence why you're getting a lot of people jumping ship and going back to yeah. other promotions like Bellator and stuff where they can hate other sponsors Aye. Scott Malone made a really good point about that f- uh, for the financial side of things so what he was saying if, if fighters are let's say like the cage warriors and that at that fighting promotions like that if they were actually making enough money to commit themselves and train full time the product of that I, the standard you're going to get is going to be because mm-hmm. obviously there's a lot of guys in the USC who are still working Danny's still, Danny's still, he's still, he's still, still working as well or? It's it's mad when you're at that level and you're you're still working. It's crazy. Even, at, even guys at Cage Warriors, like at Cage Warriors, a few years ago, I remember going to shows like in London with Burner, with Graham and that, and like there was guys on that card who were full time, and then there was like Graham was still working like forty other weeks. Aye, and like and he's still fighting, fighting and competing and beating these guys who were training full time for years and years. Is it because he didn't hear the backing, and hear the sponsor backing that these other guys had? At least that's something new, and you're seeing like guys at the amateur level, there's more sponsorship opportunity. So, from that point of view, things are improving slowly, probably too slow, but, but they of, are they are right. getting better. But I think, I think I think the point is about this as well. It's like you don't need any of us fight because we want to make money. That's like at the end of the day, if you're in this sport to make money, you're you're in it for the wrong reasons. No. Listen, you, you, you don't... <laughs> they're doing their right mind when it's to go in and fight another man for any amount of money. No, it you, you will get... I get offered the daft amount of money you go and fight somebody for it, but at the end of the day, to dead for the... If the casual fan doesn't understand the amount of hours you put in to train, like, to put, the graft you have to put in to even think about being considered to be good enough to fight no. at amateur level. It's even at even at amateur level, not even professional level. It's it's frightening, but a lot of people don't see that. They only see at the end product. They see it on the night the guys who buy tickets after you come along to shows. The casual fans, they pay their fair to afford to get whatever the tickets are, which is greatly appreciated by every single fighter like, across the board because you don't understand how much it means to you. Somebody wants to come pay money to watch you fight. Aye. It means a lot to people. A lot of people don't understand that, but like they don't see the six to eight weeks or six weeks eight weeks you eight, two sessions a day six hours a day training sometimes three sessions a day the dieting the the times you, you miss out and go on nice out with your pals and spending time with family and going on holidays and things like that because you choose to do we don't they need to force us to do this we do this because we love it and we enjoy it that's it you've got to have a love for it to yeah. you've got to have a love for it to do it 
be otherwise mad. you might just be a madman. Uh, <laughs> there's, 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 there's a lot of guys that. out there who are just playing madmen, but as well. But it's, you have to be a special kind of madman just to rock up on the night and fight somebody before any, nah, before any kind of training. Right, um, well, one last thing we'll go over is we had a we had a few questions pop in, so I think we'll we'll get to the questions. So the first question came in from a, a certain Mister Peter Knox. Um, so Mister Knox is uh, is curious what's going on with Coach Dillon and his picks at the moment because uh, they don't seem to be spectacular. <laughs> what is happening, James? <laughs> I'm on this uh, Scottish World Cup team picking Aye. for Edmund UK. <laughs> But I'm trying to lure them into a false sense of security, thinking that I'm rubbish at it early. I went and picked like, I'd, I'd about a month for it or something. I get six for six one week. And some guy messaged me saying, I used your pick, send me your PayPal, I'll send you 20% of my winnings. I think he won like a couple of grand. And another guy <laughs> messaged me saying, have you, have, you got a, have you got a system for picking these? I was like, no, I've not really. Um, and then I went next week, I think I went like five and six, and then it was like four out of four one week. And then as soon as they started doing this World Cup thing, I think I'm, set, I think I'm last or second last. I think I've been getting like one out of four or one out of five the last couple of weeks. But last week I'd done a wee bit better. First week I was, I was, I was dreadful. Last week I, I let some people sway my, my picks. Right. I actually changed them. Peter Knox can verify this because I had to go back on the, the wee hang and change them a bit. And it, it's show up in the back a wee bit so I'll be back but I'm just letting the rest of the guys think that they're picking up a lead just to make it more competitive for myself do you, do you believe him or do you think he's crumbling <laughs> under the pressure it's hard to pick fights <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 can, I, can, I can barely pick my nose like, I, would, I wouldn't even try and pick fights oh, I'm, I'm terrible I'll come back we'll see you at the end of the season who's, who's last I, you, I used to just copy yours James but I've been doing that last wee while two <laughs> weeks I've been off for two weeks Look, there's no problem there's no crisis yet I like put, I'll, I'll maybe put a bet like a fluke bet on like once the blue moon and stuff and like, and, uh, see I go on about winning the lottery. You're lucky if I buy a lottery ticket twice a year. Do you know what I mean? I'm that, I'm that kind of person. Oh, you definitely win that. See, as soon as somebody says, put money on it, nah, you're right. Do, do, you know what, <laughs> you're right. do you want to know why I don't buy a lottery ticket? Because see, when I buy that lottery ticket, I genuinely believe this is the night I win it. Even though I've only played it once in six months. And oh. throughout the day, I'm, I, I don't know, I'll buy two boats, I'll buy one. Aye, I'll do that. And then I'll buy a bit, I'll, I'll quarter a million all day in the house. I'll give this one that money. And then obviously, when you realise you've not won it, uh, I'm nearly greeting well, you can't imagine I'll buy it right I'll, I'll, I'll talk I'll go on a whim I'll be in a shop one day I'll just say oh geez I never pick numbers like that right my dad's religiously oh, every yeah. week he plays the same numbers he must spend about 40 quid a week right my dad and this is no word they're like my mum and dad watch this when it goes out next week or whatever Ask my dad, he opened his wallet, there's about 40 lottery tickets a week in this, right? You're lucky I think the Macy's ever going to 20 quid. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm going like, once the boom and I'll get a lucky dip, or I'll get two lucky dips or something, Aye. same as you if it's a big, like, you know, million thing. And like, I'll deliberately I'll put it in my visor in the van, right? It'll be about day and work, and that, or I'll be in here, and I'll leave, and I'll no check it for a couple of days. And, and then I'll pop out the van one day, and I'll sit with you hanging my phone, and I'll be like, oh, and then I'll see the other week here. First time I've ever won in the lottery. Scan, can you do the scanning on your phone? Yeah. Came out your way, I was like, you're fucking better, man. Better. That's it. You've won £4.30. I was like, ah, oh. uh, it's fucking. I was like, devastated. But at the same time, I was like, all right, I've won some eventually. Uh, well, that's why I don't play it. It's a disappointment. Uh, right, absolute disappointment. We had another question come in for Nimi, but we've sort of covered that. It was regards to obviously who, who could beat Khabib. So we've, we've sort of covered that one. I made a, a question come in for Jamie Campbell. Now, his was a two-part question. Part of it was about uh, Barbosa and uh, Felder fight. So, obviously, again, we've covered that. But he's also asked... Um, so, we're talking about dream fights here, anybody. And this is for you as well, James. If you could pick any any get fighter past, present, who would you like to get in the cage and fight? It's a question, like... Uh, it's not it's not anything I've ever thought about it. it's like I've never thought about that really I don't know uh, there must be so, like even maybe not necessarily just to fight just to build up in the experiences there a guy that you're pro either at the highest level or bailiff or well, I don't know that's a mad question that's a good question to be fair what about you James have you I don't think I would think uh, about that like. it's not a nice question to ask me I miss fighting I've not I've, I've <laughs> you'll be sparring no more <laughs> My last fight was in April 2013 and there's no a day goes past that I don't think like 
maybe I should just do one more. And then I kind of talk myself to it and then I go online and I see Paul Reed still fighting and I think he's older than me. And I'm like, this Paul Reed's still fighting, maybe I should just do one more. He's looking in good shape. But um I would I've I lost nine fights as a professional. Some of them I, I definitely lost, like guys were just better than me. Mm-hmm. Um the guy I fought in Japan and, and Sir Wan Kakai and stuff like that. Some of them were, were kinda could have went either way, but I would like to fight all nine of them again, every one of them. Aye. Uh, and then take it for there. I never lost much of an amateur, I think I have ten kind of amateur semi pro. I lost once in Thai against a Thai world champion for a world title. He stopped me with a cut and it didn't bother me that much, but the the MMA ones, I, I revenged a couple. I revenged one of the losses. I got it back, but so any of the guys that beat me as a as a pro, they've, they've still been around about the same age as me, maybe. Well, or wait, maybe. Are you? Are you? Is there an, an intrigue as well to see just see what you would be like going back in there and actually? Because obviously you can spar and you can do stuff in the gym, but can actually in there and and fighting uh, in the cage with a crowd competitive. Is, is there a curiosity um, there? That wouldn't bother me. I, I was always quite comfortable. I said, I wouldn't do the diet. Like, mm-hmm. the, the 20 years of, of dieting was what I then said, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, it's it's no good for you mentally or physically. Um, and then I, I wasn't like the bigger... At, at one point, I was maybe one of the bigger guys at Bantamweight about. I was like 5'9", and, and I was weighing in at 61, but came back up to 70. And then it got to a stage where these younger guys were coming in bigger than me. And I was like, mm-hmm. right, so that advantage is gone. But I couldn't go to featherweight because Turner and Robert Whiteford were in the gym. And whenever they grabbed me, I was like, They're, I can't compete with featherweights. The two of them are exceptionally strong featherweights, but I was like, I can't go to featherweight because they, they're too strong for me to deal with. But I definitely, I wouldn't do it anywhere near the way I used to fight it. I'd, I'd happy fight, but I don't mind that. Um, some of my stuff's probably got better. Like my jiu-jitsu has obviously improved. I think I was a purple belt when I stopped MMA and I've focused on that pretty much since uh, got black belt and stuff like that my, my striker I'm not doing as much and I've got wee tricks and stuff for, for wrestling and stuff like that physically I'm, I'm nowhere near as fast as I was and stuff like that so I'd have to adapt there but mm. if I was fighting guys that were running about the same age as me and stuff it, I'm pretty sure I could do alright So you've no, you've no shut the door completely on this <laughs> there is still a possibility <laughs> I can see there's still that wee bit there it's a that ask well, any, ask any gum shield the gum shield the, the more it's right Friday and Sunday we walk in the mix I had my gum shield ways at the weekend the MTK like so uh, yeah, just in case there's a late follow I think you didn't you didn't go to any show as an active fighter without a gum shield it's, like, it's just the thing you always take a gum shield with you and if you've got your training bag I'm 19 so you take your shorts and a box in it because just in case, just, just you never know case. what's going to happen you just, you can, you could, somebody could who was it done it in the case where I mind um, there's a guy Peter Tark's done it yeah, a couple mm. of times he was in the queue waiting to get into a show I was at once Aye. and uh, somebody came and took him out the queue and the next thing I knew he was fighting he's on the second fight or something Colin Baxter done it Colin Years Baxter ago. done it it's, it's quite common at grassroots level Aye, the regional level it's, it's definitely What's a common thing f- uh, English guy young guy done it uh, what's his name what's his name you could pardon him was he it was decent the guy done it in cage wires, I can't remember his name. It was a few years ago, and he was like, I'll come back to me in a bit. I'll come back to you when you're off the show. Yeah, okay, well, well, because. So, have you, have you got MD? Is there MD that's jumped out that you'd like to fight? I'd like to fight. I'd like to fight that. Uh, I fought a guy called Jill Zegers on a show, just to see him. I didn't. I was thinking, Mary, like, fighting guys like, at top level with this sport, but I fought a guy called Jill Zegers on, Jill Zegers on the Evolution of Combat show in yeah. May. I made a. Drastic mistake that day, mm-hmm. and taking that away from me beat me. I got beat fair and square. Mm-hmm. I oh, I, and I was I was being sick, but he did beat me. So, but I'd like to agree on that and fight him again. But he's turning pro that next month, I think mm-hmm. in October, and he's going back to flyweight and all the best thing. He's a stand up. He's a great guy. He's a, I've actually become quite pally on after this after Aye. this fight. I'd like to fight him again. I also fought a guy on top. His name is Jacob Seismich. I was meant to fight him for the featherweight belt a year and a half ago he weighed in at 69 kilos for a 65.7 fight and yeah he did beat me but I, I've, again I've evolved out for that I, I was very angry with myself on that and very angry going into the fight because I was so pissed off that he missed weight and just just maybe being a bit amateur in the head and no mm-hmm. kind of switching on so I'd like to re, I'd like to rematch him yeah. uh, I'd, 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 I'd like to rematch Liam McCracken again as well to be fair just, just because it was a, a proper good fun fight yeah. and 
I think there's, there's arguments from both sides to who could win it and it'd be good to kind of put it to bed but uh, there's been he's obviously he's just he's just young as well so it'd be cool to see how he gets on he's got the world as I said earlier on so it'd be cool to see how he gets on there and I wish him all the best for that but again I uh, the three losses I have got on my on my I can't say it's an amateur record but mm. it'd be cool to kind of hear another crack at it too especially the Giles Eggers one because I never even got a chance to perform I over it that day like an absolute clown and it would have been sick aye uh, warming up in that and just being a just for pure personal error being a muppet aye. and so I'd, I'd especially like to redo that just to see or just to go in and perform do you know what I mean aye, and you're and be, fight him at your best I thought honestly they'd been an absolute donut and listening to Stevie Morton going for something to eat with him instead of sticking to my own thing <laughs> Is Stevie Malt the best guy to take advice off? It's too plain, isn't it? Oh, it's it's so plain. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, aye, that, that, that's us, guys. We'll just we'll finish up, Matt. Just one quick thing we wanted to uh, speak about is just want to talk a wee bit about the sponsors and the guys that are involved with the gym just to give them a wee, wee shout out in the show. Um, yeah, for the gym, I'll go we'll get uh, Braided Auto Service, Bales Craft Bakery, and the Tree Hugger. So uh, local companies, they're all local companies. And uh, and for you, who's for obviously we spoke about uh, spoke about strength and conditioning. Aye, uh, for me, John from Pain, Painless Performance, um, Carl and Gunning at the uh, Barnes Bistro in Livingston. It's a meal prep company. They've actually got a cafe in that as well. You can sit in here something. Deep. I've got. Uh, Lovian, Ian, I called Ian Barraman, he's uh, my physio. Uh, Lovian Health and Performance, he's actually just in Blackburn. Um, I go into him every week, once a week at least, maybe twice sometimes, and I've always got something else there. So Aye. I'm always keeping him on his toes. There's uh, the guys at uh, Brad Flex Unit, and uh, a guy called Grant Farker, who owns mm-hmm. HBO Pressure Washers. So they kind of team up to deal with, like, they kind of provide me all my supplements and stuff. Like, there's no questions asked. I basically just phone them up or message them saying can I come up and get I need this and that and they just basically open the door in the office and just say take what you want Aye. just tell me what you need uh, if, if it's not here I'll get it in for you so and like Grant at H2O as well he, he gets me some of my equipment and that as well like gloves and if I need gloves or I need shinies or if I need anything they just basically says to me tell me what you want I can either order it for you I'll just give you the money and I'll go into settings out for Ross who always like, looks after us and that gives me good prices on everything stuff and then uh, Natasha and Kevin Baldwin who who have done all my walkout t-shirts that I've ever had and they've actually just jumped on board to sponsor us for my apparel and stuff so I get my walkout t-shirts I got done at the weekend and that they're always buying on they're always giving, getting them on time and it's always a really good quality stuff so just thanks to everybody who wants to kind of get like help you on your way uh, to being there so it means the world to us like it does help it helps a lot it helps tenfold like so Perfect. appreciate that thanks very much brilliant and that is us that's a wrap